This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson. And Levy Hartfield is a retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. The bat might not be one of the feature animals when thinking about Mississippi wildlife, like the deer or the catfish, but Mississippi is home to 15 types of bats that play a significant role in Mississippi's ecosystem. Today, we welcome Dr. Nicole Hodges to talk about the role of the bat and answer your questions about these winged mammals. Also, as always, Dr. Major is here ready to take your pet questions. You can join the conversation with your phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464 or email the show. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. If you ever miss Creature Comforts on Thursday morning, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning. That hope everyone is doing well this morning. Libby, let's start with you. Are you still out there in Oregon? Yes, I am. Any more Woke observations? 48 on... degrees. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> uh, any more observations on what you've been seeing? Oh, yeah, seen a lot of birds and all kinds of stuff. I guess first off, I might mention that when I talked to Java about uh, just walking outside and taking one deep breath, and I smell the Douglas fir. It's uh, noticeable. It's, I guess, like a Christmas tree smell. And uh, we're surrounded with conifers, and uh, the woods are the predominant tree here is Douglas fir. It's a big, beautiful uh gorgeous deep green uh needles on the tree so that's something that makes it very different and the air is dry and crisp and cold every morning even if we've had 85 degree weather the afternoon before i've been watching california quail this week and uh they're great little birds similar to our bob white quail but then again very different i guess they uh run around like quail. I, I very seldom see quail anymore, but it was a common bird of my youth, so I'm enjoying seeing the California quail. They have a funny little top knot, and uh, it's a modified clump of six feathers that form a little bobbly-looking thing that um, shakes around and makes them look real comical when they run. Well, I hope you're enjoying that weather out there uh, because you, you mentioned dry. Here it's uh, quite humid. I was out playing a tennis match the other night, and after about 30 minutes was completely drenched with sweat. It wasn't really that hot, but it is just so sticky, uh, and I think the hurricane certainly has a lot to do with that. So uh, glad to, uh, we always enjoy the updates, uh, kind of a different snapshot of a different part of the country. As I say, enjoy that uh, nice weather uh, and because, well, you know what you're coming back to. So, <laughs> Yes, definitely. And um, my prayers go out to everybody that was affected by that storm. And I certainly hope it doesn't get bad in Jackson later today. Mississippi is uh, possibly under the gun uh, today and I think maybe tomorrow parts of the state, uh, the, the western half especially. So uh, be on guard for that. If you live in western Mississippi, certainly you know uh, what the situation is. And I hope that you know how to prepare for severe weather. And Dr. Major, when it comes to severe weather, sometimes it really spooks our dogs or cats or pets. Remind us, if you would, please, of some uh, tips and things that pet owners can keep in mind and do to kind of help their pets through what might possibly be severe weather. That's a great, great point. Uh, we see a lot of anxiety. Even now, I think the uh, pandemic has uh, promulgated anxiety in both the owners and the pets. But uh, a lot of them are very sensitive to storms, the changes in barometric pressure, but the thunder and lightning, this sort of thing. Uh, some people swear by the thunder shirts, which is a form of swaddling. Uh, some dogs do quite well with that, uh, and in some cases we uh, have to use some, what shall I say, some tranquilizers to help uh, get a pet through this. Uh, I think we are observing more right now because a lot of people are at home, and they may be seeing uh, changes in behavior that has been there all along, 
or cha- appears to be a change, but uh, I've seen things that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. We need to be very uh, cognizant of the fact that there are going to be homeless uh, animals uh, being transported this way or animals that we may need to help uh, take care of. Uh, I know there are several rescue groups that are, are working there, and I don't think they really know or are able to assess the damage at this point. And it does uh, bear out that even here in Jackson, we need to have uh, adequate uh, what emergency type uh, measures where we can take our pets if there is uh, danger, uh, where we can take some food, water, vaccination records, uh, this sort of thing, so we can be prepared. Uh, so if uh, if you do come across a stray animal uh, that might have been displaced in the storm or something, or maybe just in general, uh, what is always the best thing to, to do uh, when you see a, maybe a dog or a cat that appears to be lost? This is a good, great question, and some people are better able to uh, approach an animal like this. But if you are able to approach it, uh, use caution because it may be scared. It could uh, bite defensively. Uh, I always carry a leash or two in my truck uh, and a blanket uh, simply because a lot of times it facilitates uh, getting an animal into your vehicle uh, if you have uh, a blanket or a large towel. But approach those animals carefully because they've been traumatized. uh, And we see this all the time here uh, with stray animals, not necessarily because of any disaster, but there are plenty of stray animals that are Uh, on the streets and roads here in Jackson. Uh, I guess the main thing that I would do would be to contact uh, your veterinarian or the Mississippi Animal Rescue League or one of the other uh, facilities that can take take in lost or uh, animals that you don't know where they came from. Uh, it comes to mind too the the chip. So if uh, if uh, you take uh, you know an animal that you find to maybe your vet uh, in your case, I guess Doctor Major, would you be able to use a device to possibly read a chip in the lost uh, animal? Yes, it's always wise to be able to scan and to uh, we have a scanner. We have a couple of scanners that actually you can read what the chip number says, and you can uh, contact the company then, and hopefully it will be registered. That there's really no need to have a chip if it's not registered because then you have you really don't know how to contact the owner. But the uh, different companies, there are several different uh, manufacturers of chips, uh, and the reader is a universal reader and can pick up uh, the numbers. There's a code or numbers that the chip has. And uh, the uh, different rescue groups and veterinarians, most veterinarians do have uh, a reader so they can check out that animal. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, pets' reaction to severe weather or when they get spooked, I know as a cat owner, I would say to other cat owners, if if you can't find your cat, maybe kind of learn where some of his hiding spots are because I know my cat would probably, you know, maybe run under the couch or under the bed or somewhere that he knows it's, if he feels safe. They, I know they like to be sometimes in sort of confined areas. So if you if you kind of know your uh, your your cat's hiding spots, then you can, you know, just make sure that he's in there, he or she's in there uh, staying safe in in severe weather. And I'll bet your cat has a spot that you don't know about. (laughs) (laughs) Several, I think. (laughs) Right. And uh, another thing, especially for the cats, is to have a carrier available. Uh, If you do have to leave all of a sudden or quickly, uh, a carrier, uh, it's, it's really not great to have cats in the car. Uh, loose. I saw a video or a picture from one of the affected areas, and the lady was trying to get animals out as quickly as possible. But uh, she had about four or five cats in the car and dogs. So, you know, cats are strange. A lot of times they will bolt, and then you have a real problem of trying to catch a cat in unfamiliar places. Oh, I know that even in my house, I anytime I do something like uh, go to the vet or, or give him some uh, medicine, I, I I shut off all potential uh, you know rooms and things so that the, we're we're both confined in the smallest possible area, so I can right. maybe get the upper hand a little bit. Uh, Doctor Major, here is a, an email that says our twelve week old kitten has no meow, even though he tries, just a raspy hiss like sound that comes out. 
He was rescued from a litter of neglected outside kittens, so I don't have a history. A vet visit is scheduled, but wondering uh, your opinion on what might be the cause. Well, great question. And, of course, uh, I could say in some cases that might be a blessing that the cat can't meow. But uh, sometimes they meow at the most inopportune times. I suspect this kitten will develop a meow as time goes on. A lot of kittens, really until they're four or five months old, don't make a lot of noise. They, You know, you think of a kitten doing the mew-mew type thing like he's looking for food or mother. But a lot of the kittens do not have that ability at this point. Point. They can do it probably, but they just don't know how. I will almost assuredly that it will develop. There are a few cats that uh, owners say have never made a sound, but that would be quite rare. And also, I've always heard that uh, cats sometimes use the meow to communicate, especially with humans. So I'm thinking that maybe if the cat were rescued and comes into the home and is, is around humans more, that maybe uh, they'll figure out that that's the best way to try to communicate with uh, humans. Maybe so, and of course there's some controversy about that. We probably make more meow sounds to our cat than <laughs> the cat makes to us, uh, and that's that's okay too. And uh, if you see a group of cats, they really don't vocalize that much unless they have a reason to, so they don't walk around going like the what meow makes cat, going meow, meow, meow <laughs> uh, to each other. But they do talk, but uh, they're not quite as vocal as we make them in our own homes talking to them all right it's time for our first break of the hour we'll be we returned we'll begin our discussion with our guest dr nicole hodges we're talking about bats their benefits to the environment where they're found and more believe it or not somebody listening right now might even have bats in their attic if it's you join the conversation and give us a phone call the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring our phone number one eight seven seven. 672-7464. Email the show. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. Stay tuned. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest today is Dr. Nicole Hodges. She's here to talk about the bats that call Mississippi home, 15 different species, in fact. If you want to join the conversation with a question or a comment, our phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can send an, anim- uh, an email to animals at mpbonline.org. So, Nicole, thanks for joining us. Appreciate you having us or you being with us on the show today. Hey, how's everyone? Doing good. Tell us a little bit about your background, if you would, and your interest in bats. Okay, um, well, I'm a wildlife ecologist with most of my experience working with endangered species and habitat management. And I'm also a veterinarian, so I'm involved with monitoring wildlife diseases in Mississippi. Um, I've spent most of my career specifically working with gopher tortoises and bats, and I'm currently serving as the coordinator for the Mississippi Natural Heritage Program. Um, And you asked me, like, how I got into working with bats. Was that the next question? Yeah. Okay. Um, as an undergraduate student, I was started working with bats, uh, working on a graduate project at Nazi National Wildlife Refuge. Another girl and I were hired to conduct surveys for cavity trees in the Bowman Harbor Forest on the refuge, and we surveyed, it was over 600 trees, like four times a year to record bat use. And... That's where I got started, but to this day, I still have the privilege of working with a great group of bat biologists across the state, like Miss Mitten and Survey and Bridges and Box Covert under our highways. Uh, so as we mentioned at the top of the show, uh, 15 different species of bats in Mississippi. Give us an idea, if you could, maybe uh, about the difference in uh, things like size and, and that sort of thing. What are the, how small are the smallest and how big are the biggest? 
the smallest are, well, all of them, we have micro, what's called micro bats here in the United States. We don't have the big fruit bats like other countries do. Um, so they're about the size of our hand. And the smallest would be probably the tricolor and the southeastern myotis. And the largest would be our tree bat, with the yellow bat being the largest. Um, it spreads, probably has a wing spread, uh, probably about six inches across. So they get pretty big compared to the other ones that are in the state. Uh, what about coloration? How how much of a variety is there in that? Um, with so they. They're like a gray tawny color, and some of them have a red hue, um, like our red bat and Seminole bats. Um, and even different different parts of the year, they will shed, and they change colors. Um, is there a reason for that, maybe camouflage or something, why they would change uh, color during the year? I think... Um, it's mostly due to, like, it's the little juveniles. You know, they're, it's kind of like ducks molting into a, like the juvenile birds molting into their adult plumage. I think that's what's mostly, you know, what's causing it. We're visiting today on Creature Comforts with Dr. Nicole Hodges, and we're going to be talking about bats. So if you have a bat experience you'd like to share with us or a question about bats, our phone lines are open. Give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. I think a lot of us have heard about vampire bats. Do we have any of those here in Mississippi? No, actually we don't. Those are uh, native to Central America. So we don't have any blood-feeding bats in the United States. All right, so our, our necks are all safe here in Mississippi then, I guess. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Uh, what about of the 15 species in Mississippi? Do we have some rare bats? We do. Um, the gray and Indian bat are fairly endangered. Uh, the northern long ear bat is fairly threatened. Uh, southeastern myotis some rachnistic ear bat and hoary bat, they're all listed as a species of concern in the state. All of those are our protected species. Okay, so that total that was about I think six or seven. I think you mentioned it's almost almost about half of the the bats we have here are concerned or endangered. Then, so what is uh, what are some of the things? Is it loss of habitat that's uh, that's causing some of these issues? Yes, uh, it's mostly like due to people. So whenever we need to build a house or put in an agricultural field, or like our loblolly pine stands. Um, that takes away habitat, like native habitat, from our bats. But that's mostly what our what call, that's the threat to bats in Mississippi. Um, I think like snakes and some other creatures, bats uh, sometimes uh, scare people, or people are afraid of them or don't like them. But uh, are they of a benefit to us? The bats. Yes. Yes. Um, so they eat insects. And they eat a lot of the agricultural pests that affect our crops. So it saves farmers a lot of money when we have a lot of bats in the ecosystem, uh, removing the insects from the habitat. So is their diet primarily insects, or do they eat other things as well? It's primarily insects. So they eat moths, beetles, mosquitoes. Like Those are the things that they eat. And uh, a friend of mine was uh, in Australia several years ago, and he told me that uh, they actually use bats for mosquito control uh, there. So uh, they, they definitely, do they do they eat a lot of insects? Do they have a voracious appetite? Definitely. Um, they can eat up to their body weight of insects in, in a night. So they can, like if you have like a big colony, like in one of the big caves, like out west or up north, um it can really do a dent in the insect population. Well, my thought is anything that eats mosquitoes is, is okay in my in my book, that's for sure. Uh, we have got a caller on the line, uh, so why don't we say, hold on for one second, we'll get to that. Uh, there we go. Zach's on the line from Ocean Springs. Good morning, Zach. Go ahead. Hey, good morning. 
What do you I'm have so for us? I'm so excited to hear a bat person. Go ahead, Zach. Uh, yeah, uh, well, to your earlier point, a single little brown bat can catch up to 600 mosquitoes in one hour. Wow. So that's pretty good. I was just going to say that uh, when I grew up, my grandpa, there was a bat colony that lived in an abandoned house next door. And uh, they would get in his house, and he'd go after him with a tennis racket. And I was just going to say that you don't have to do that. If one gets in your house, uh, I had one get in my house and just waited until he roosted and caught him with a coffee can. And it was easy, no muss, no fuss. And so that's that's all I have to say for people who you know see a bat and get super scared. It's not that big a deal. All right, Zach, thanks for your call. Appreciate you calling in this morning. Uh, let's stay on the phones for just a moment and continue with Terry in Tupelo. Good morning, Terry. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to be really nerdy right now because I got so excited Sunday. Me and my wife saw an e- a female Eastern Hercules beetle, which after looking it up, it said that you may only see one once or twice in your lifetime. Wow. And uh, and so we were just real excited. I have a picture of it and everything, but it is a female. The male has a horn. It is almost like a little horn that comes out of the top of his head, but the female does not have a horn. And they're yellow and black spotted. But And I'd say they're probably an inch long, but I was so excited. Terry, where where did y'all see this at? Where were you at? In Tupelo. I mean, our uh, house. Oh, so it was in in your in like in your yard? Yeah, it said a lot of times they'll uh, they generally burrow in logs and and things of that nature. And if they do, if you do happen to see them, it's usually because they were attracted to a light at night or something, and they got disoriented. And uh, and so that's why it was actually on our back patio. And my wife came in screaming. <laughs> She's like, "Get out here!" <laughs> she had never seen a be- she'd never seen a beetle that big before. And she goes, "I wonder if it flies." And about that time, it took off. And she, <laughs> she went running for the hill. <laughs> I, th- I think that might have been my reaction, too. Hey, Terry, you mentioned taking a picture of it. If you don't mind, could you email it to us, and we'll post it on our webpage. It's animals. I, I will. Hold on just a second. Let me, let me just grab a pen real quick. All right. Um, okay, animals. At mpbonline.org. Sending it right now. Great. Uh, Libby, have you ever heard of this beetle that uh, Terry's talking about? Oh, yes, and it's one of my favorite creatures. In fact, um, my grandson Norman now has a a little toy Hercules beetle, and uh, they are wonderful things. There are several of those large, very strong beetles. I mean, they're made like a little army tank or something. They're incredible. And uh, the best place to find them, just like Terry said, and Terry, I'm so glad you got to see it. Aren't they incredible? But uh, in a lot of my life would be. He said he's glad, but he's not sure his wife was. <laughs> oh, well, maybe as time goes on, she'll be glad when she tells the story. You just have, kind of have to turn it into family folklore, I guess. But uh, they are really exciting things to see. And if any of our listeners happen upon one, we'd love to see the picture. Uh, Dr. Major, what about uh, you? Have real, you? Real, Go ahead, Terry. Real, real quickly, can you give me that email address again, my pen? Sure. i uh, have to grab another pen. Animals, okay, go ahead. animals at mpbonline.org. MPB Online. Okay. Yep. All right, Terry, great call. Thanks for coming, uh, calling in and sharing with us. Dr. Major, are, are you familiar with that beetle? Oh, yes. Uh, I may have to bring one uh, to show you next time we're together. Uh, I, you know that I, I do collect insects. Right. And, uh, I have several of the uh, different types of, uh, I guess you would call it Hercules. Uh, some people say a rhinoceros beetle. Uh, and there's there's a variety of them, but uh, it's pretty amazing that they were able to see this. And they aren't, they aren't that common. And uh, I would say that uh, the best place to see them would be around a light at night. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually that would be where you would see them. But they're, they're quite large. 
there's some variation in color as well. I have seen some that were pretty much green, uh, and then when I say green, almost fluorescent green, not quite, but uh, that. And then there's uh, some like the ones he described, the one he described. So they're they're interesting animals. All right, time for another break. Uh, when we get back, we will continue our visit with our guest, Dr. Nicole Hodges, talking about bats. We've got a caller on the line from Oxford. We'll get to that call. And your call, <coughs> if you'd like to join in today, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 or email the show. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. We'll be back with more, so stay tuned. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. I'm Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. It's Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Our guest for the hour is Dr. Nicole Hodges, who studies the bats of Mississippi. If you missed any of today's program, you can always subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcasting app or subscribing to the MPB public media app. And to join the conversation this morning, call us at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Email the show. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. Before the break, Terry from Tupelo called in to talk about uh, a Hercules beetle that he saw on his back porch uh, or backyard in Tupelo. Uh, and after looking it up and looking at some of the pictures, I think I might have been with Terry's wife who had kind of a, a freaked out reaction because this is a big looking it, I don't know, uh, but I think I would have probably run back into the house uh, had I seen one of these in my backyard as well. It's a big, uh, kind of a interesting, creepy-looking creature, but uh, certainly a great specimen of beetle. As I mentioned today, our guest is Dr. Nicole Hodges. We're talking about the bats of Mississippi, and we've got a caller on the line with a bat question. So we say good morning to William in Oxford. Go ahead, William. You're on the air with us. Hi. Good morning. I had a question for Dr. Hodges. Um she mentioned that uh, loblolly pine stands and similar pine areas that have been replanted after being cut over or farmed for years uh, uh, are perhaps marginal habitat for bats. But I was curious what bats you, what bat species and the number of bats you would see in uh, those kinds of stands. Um, were there any at all, or uh, um, were they just, or were there are some, you know, I was just curious about what you would see. Well, it, lonely pine stands are monotypic, so there's not much diversity out there, but some of our tree bats will, you know, use the area to forage, like the red bats and Seminole bats, but for the most part, their native habitat are the hardwood uh, forests, like in the bottomlands, in mm-hmm. the areas where the trees are really big, and they form cavities for them to roost in. Um, mm-hmm. So the lonely pine stands, I mean, bats do use them some, but not as much as they would their native habitat. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. William, we appreciate your call. Uh, this is Creature Comforts. Uh, we've got some open phone lines if you want to join the conversation. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. Six seven two seven four six four. 7464 So, Nicole, we talked about uh, that the bats are voracious insect eaters. How do they locate and capture their food? They use what's called echolocation. So, basically, they're sending out these waves, and it, it hits the insects, and it comes back to them, and they know where to fly to go catch them. Um, and that's where, you know, the myth that people think bats are blind, but it's because they use echolocation instead of their eyesight. So bats are not actually, in fact, blind? No. They can see just as well as anyone else can. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, I, I, all right, so I guess when they're flying around or whatever, they can still see, but they use that unique skill they have uh, to locate. Uh, I would imagine, too, I mean, bugs are so small, I guess that echolocation really helps them pinpoint uh, the small prey that they're going after. Definitely. Uh, can you have a pet bat in your yard to chew up all the bugs around your house? 
Well, you can put up bat houses around your house and uh, attract bats to your property. But as far as calling it a pet, you can't have wildlife as pet like native wildlife in Mississippi as pets. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, bat boxes. If you wanted to put one up in your yard, uh, are there some idea, guidelines about maybe where you should put it up, how tall it might be, those sorts of things? Um, it needs to be 20 feet in the air. And usually multi-chambered boxes work better than a single box. Um, and if you put them back to back, that helps too. And having them near a water source um, will attract bats as well. Um, am I correct in saying that bats are mostly nocturnal so that we wouldn't probably see a lot of their activity during the day? Correct. Uh, but then at night is when they come out and uh, and hunt for bugs, I guess. Yes. All right. Uh, what about uh, rural areas, you know, maybe in the woods that we talked about? You talked about uh, the hardwoods, but uh, are bats found in uh, in urban and suburban areas also? They are. Um, usually you see them flying around. Like, they really love light sources because that attracts insects. So in the, like in Jackson, for example, you'll see them flying around the yard lights and stuff. All right. Uh, looks like we got a couple more callers on the line. So why don't we start with um, Rachel, who's calling in from Jackson. Good morning, Rachel. You're on the air with us. Hi. How are you doing? Good. What do you have for us? Um, what I was wondering is, um, is there any specific ways or places to get bat boxes to encourage them to live inside the city? because I really don't like the idea of um, pesticides. And I, w- I think it would be nice to introduce something that's a little bit more eco-friendly, like bats. So I don't, but I don't know how to build a bat box or where to get a bat box um, to encourage them to nest in my yard. Definitely. Um, there is, uh, like, bat, co- bat Conservation International... They provide the uh, blueprints on how to make them, but they also sell them on their website. And actually, forestry suppliers in Jackson, they actually sell them. Um, But there's different companies that will sell bat boxes. Um, And you were talking about, like, for the whole city, what would be really neat was, like, out in Florida, they have what they call bat condos. Hmm. Like, they're really large. And it's a really good ecotourism event, too. Um, But they have built these huge houses that attract thousands and thousands of bats, and that would be um, really good to attack the insect population. All right, Rachel, thanks for your call. In addition, our producer Java will post some links for bat boxes uh, on uh, the webpage, and you can find it at uh, mpbonline.org slash creature comforts. And, you know, Nicole, you mentioned that I was in Austin a couple of years ago, and they're famous for uh, the ecotourism of the bats that congregate under some of the bridges uh, in, in Austin. And people uh, travel there, you know, specifically to see that. So that, that would be a good idea, and it would be quite a sight to see those large colonies of bats like that. Um, Definitely. So if, uh, if someone has a bat in their house, maybe in their attic, uh, what are some signs that it's there, and then how might they be able to uh, get rid of it? Some of the signs may be you may hear it, you know, flapping around, like making noise in the attic. Uh, if there's a lot of, if they produce a lot of poop, if there's like a large colony, you may start smelling them. Um, and in those cases, you may have to call an exterminator, and we can uh, give you some good ones that are, are bat friendly that would help you uh, remove them from your house if you need that. Um, but if there's one just on your wall, like we don't advise anyone to touch the bat there handed, but if you really couldn't get it out by opening your windows and doors and just letting it fly, you could, um, like put a piece of card, like a box over it and a piece of cardboard under it and carry it out in that box potentially is an idea of how you make can get it out of the house. But if you have 
like hundreds of them in your attic, you may need to call an exterminator. All right. Got another caller on the line. We say good morning to Mike in Memphis. Go ahead, Mike. You're on the air with us. Hello. Uh, you kind of covered a lot of it a minute ago. I was worrying about uh, uh, restoration of bat habitat. Um, like I have a whole hardwood forest that used to have pine around them. Is there ways that I can improve the habitat in that forest for bats? Definitely. Um, so they need an area to forage. Like they need an area to fly. So if the hardwood forest is really thick and not enough space in between the trees where they can fly, that would improve the habitat. Um, but mostly you just need old growth hardwood forest with large trees. Um, trees with scaly bark, like white oaks or um, shag bark hickories. Um, and the trees that form really large cavities are like bald cypress and sweet gums, black gums. So if you have those types of trees in your forest, that will encourage bats to come in. Well, great. I sure appreciate that. Thanks for your call, Mike. Good to hear from you on Creature Comforts. Uh, Nicole, you mentioned earlier the Natural Heritage Program. If you would tell us more about that. Okay. Um, So the Heritage Program identifies and maps in a special database uh, the locations of Mississippi's rarest plants, animals, and natural communities. And from this data, we process environmental reviews for development projects across the state. So we have around probably 40,000 data points in our database. And my staff and I, along with professionals from other agencies, uh, keep this database updated by going to the field to make sure that these species still exist. And recently, we started doing what's called citizen science, where we collect new records from people sending us pictures of things that they see out in their yards. And that's very helpful because, you know, we can't be everywhere. So we're grateful for those that send us pictures. Uh, You know, we get that a lot on this program, that people, you know, snap a picture of something that they see when they're out and about enjoying the great outdoors in Mississippi. Uh, Where would they send if they wanted to help out the the Heritage Program? Where would they send those uh, pictures to? Is there an email address? Yes. You can send it to my email at Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, dot Hodges, H-O-D-G-E-S, at M-M-N-S, Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, dot M-S dot gov. All right. Very good. Uh, Let's go ahead. We're going to take our final break this hour. We've got Jim on the line. Jim, thanks for holding. We'll get to your call after this break. Uh, And we'll also continue talking to our guest, Uh, Dr. Nicole Hodges. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We'll be back to wrap up the program after this. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing a doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. I'm Kevin Farrell with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Our guest this hour, Dr. Nicole Hodges, and we've been talking about the bats of Mississippi. Uh, our producer, Java, has something. Java, what do you got for us? Uh, you know, we got the uh, call about the Hercules beetle, and um, I believe it was Terry, mm-hmm. um, and he sent in his picture. But then we got two other listeners who sent in pictures of Hercules beetles also. So, I mean, people are seeing this humongous thing. I'm going to post some of these pictures to the podcast just in case anybody wants to know what they look like because these are some very extraordinary animals, insects. <laughs> Libby, is that something that is this the time of year that we would possibly see that, or is a beetle something that we would see throughout the year? Well, you could see them throughout the year, but this is a very good time to see them because it's warm and they're coming above ground a lot. They, you know, they spend a lot of time digging around in rotten logs and underground. This is one of the scarab beetles too, which is interesting. You know, the um, Egyptian culture really made scarabidae beetles uh, very. Uh, well known, I guess, when mm-hmm. you look at Egyptian art, you'll nearly always see some scarab beetles in there. 
and uh, they're really cool. The Hercules is one of the most outstanding of that group, but um, they're all really cool. There's a giant Goliath beetle that um, is, the, I guess, the strongest beetle in the world. They say all the dung beetles and the Goliath beetles because they can lift so much more than their own body weight. But they're really built for strength and durability, and it shows when you look at those pictures, doesn't it? Yes, it We'll have to do a show about them one day. That's, that's a great uh, future topic for, yeah. for Creature Comforts. Uh, let's head yeah. back to the phone lines today and talk to Jim in Madison. Jim, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, I'm under the impression that certain bats in Mississippi can carry rabies. And um, if we don't have any blood-seeking bats in Mississippi, how do the bats get rabies? Nicole, any thoughts From on other bats? Okay. Um, yeah, so but, any mammal... Well, a bat got it from an animal sometime, right? Correct. Dr. Major, can you answer that question? <laughs> good good question. Yeah, it, it is an excellent question. And there, in some species, uh, rabies seems to be endemic. Uh, when I say endemic, it can be in that population. Uh there are some examples, I think, in certain uh, skunks, uh, they can actually have rabies but not be killed by it or go into that, but they can infect other animals. Now, uh, as far as the original source, great question. I don't know. I know there have been cases where actually dolphins have had rabies. So hmm. it, any mammal can, can have rabies as far as best of my knowledge. But to tell you where the original bat got it, uh, I don't know. Wish, well, I could, wish I could answer that, yeah. All right, Jim, we appreciate your call. Thanks for joining Creature Comforts uh, this morning. So, Nicole, I think another popular might-be myth, we, you'll tell us whether it is or not, uh, is that bats sleep upside down. Is that true? And if so, why do they do that? Yes, they do sleep upside down. And that's an adaptation that bats have developed to avoid predators. So bats can't lift up and fly like a bird. They have to fall from a distance, uh, and then they start flapping their wings and fly. And that's why we say with the bat boxes, they need to be at least 20 feet in the air because we suspect or we think that they need to be that high to you know, have enough room to fall and start flying. So we mentioned uh, that they are nocturnal. Uh, are they completely inactive during the day? Do they sleep during the day? They do. They sleep during the day. Um, they normally go to their roost where they could do many different activities. They could be, um, if it's during maternity season, the mothers are taking care of the young, or they could be mating, or they could be uh, in torpor if it's like during the winter parts of the month. I mean, yeah. And I think we talked about torpor on the show before, but that's is sort of semi-hibernation. Is that correct? That's correct. Like our bats in Mississippi don't go under what's called true hibernation, where they don't wake up during the winter time because, like in Mississippi, our winters aren't cold like they are in the Northeast. So there's periods of time where there's insects that they could for, uh, eat up and forage on. Um, so. During warm, like in December, let's say it's a cold snap, and then all of a sudden it's warm again, they'll wake up and start uh, eating insects and then go back to their roost. We're nearing the end of the show, but we've got Phil on the line from Iuka who's hold on, held on for us. Phil, you're on the air, so go ahead, please. Hey, yeah, I had a question for Dr. Hodges. This isn't exactly related to bats. Uh, per se, but I heard her mention about how they're using spatial technology to map the locations of bats. Um, I was going to ask if she could go into a little more detail about that and the process. Um, so we conduct surveys across the entire state, and we have GPS is where we collect the coordinates of the locations of where we find them. Um, and then we have a database that's called Biotics. It is managed by NatureServe, and they make sure that the database is up to date and functioning properly. 
All right, Phil, thanks for that question. Uh, Nicole, earlier you mentioned the Natural Heritage Program and that little bit of citizen science. Uh, so we've been talking about these Hercules beetles, and someone took a picture. Is that the type of picture that you might want someone to email to you? Definitely, and along with the email, we need the location because um, that's what's important for our database. All right, and so... Again, we, we get a lot of folks who, who get pictures of the things that they see, uh, so we, re- pre- pre- uh, we really appreciate you sending them to animals at mpbonline.org, but also if you would send them to Nicole, and again, her email is Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, dot Hodges, H-O-D-G-E-S, at M-M-N-S, for Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, M-M-N-S dot M-S dot gov. And she asks uh, that in addition to the um, to the picture that you send along a description of, uh, I mean, uh, of where maybe where you saw it and, and um, you know, any any information I think about uh, where they were and how they found it, Nicole, I think would be helpful uh, in what you folks are doing. So that's Definitely. All right. Nicole, thanks very much. That's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. Funding is provided in part by listeners like you. To hear today's show or previous show, you can find it at mpbonline.org slash Creature Comforts. Our show is produced each week by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest, Dr. Nicole Hodges, I'm Kevin Farrell. Up next, it's our Thursday 10 a.m. show, Autocorrect with the lady auto mechanic, Allison Walker. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts. It's heard only on MPB Think Radio.